hey everyone so here i am with the topic ischemic stroke so this is like one of the most important questions that get frequently asked in the exams as an essay question so we'll deal with uh, the definition of stroke the risk factors associated with it the types of stroke and we'll go in detail uh, about the uh, we'll go in detail regarding ischemic stroke so here we go now stroke is also called as a cerebrovascular accident and the reason it's called like that is because there is a sudden neurological deficit which is produced because of an underlying vascular mechanism so that's why it's called as a cerebrovascular accident now it has two types of risk factors modifiable and non modifiable modifiable risk factors are basically that could be adjusted with your lifestyle now what are the risk factors it can be alcoholism cigarette smoking hypertension dyslipidemia diabetes excessive use of ocps or oral contraceptive pills then if you have any cardiac diseases like atrial fibrillation and one of the most important causes being a transient ischemic attack they usually say that if you develop a tia or a transient ischemic attack your chances of developing a stroke in future is very high so now you have non modifiable factors in non modifiable factors notice that age age means what they are trying to tell is as you grow older the chances for developing a stroke is high gender it's more common in males than females race ethnicity it's common in certain race as well as ethnic backgrounds and then you have your family history if you have a family history of stroke the chances for developing is also high now this is uh, basically a picture showing the three types of stroke an ischemic stroke hemorrhagic stroke and transient ischemic attack these are the three types in ischemic stroke now what happens in an ischemic stroke is that there will be a blood vessel in your brain that gets blocked as a result of which there is a reduction in blood supply to that area and ischemia occurs so ischemic stroke now hemorrhagic stroke it's a situation where there is a weakened blood vessel that is there in your brain which ruptures and thus producing neurological deficit now you have transient ischemic attack okay so this is kind of important uh, because transient ischemic attack the symptoms usually don't last for more than an hour it's usually less than 1 hour and it's caused by a temporary clot so there is temporary reduction of blood flow and that's why it's called as mini stroke as you can see in the black box now this is again another diagram showing uh, the types of ischemic stroke that is there are three types embolic thrombotic and lacuna stroke and hemorrhagic which is divided into intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage now this is the pathophysiology Uh, as you see there is an occlusion of an intracranial vas- vessel which can occur because of a thrombi emboli etc and because of that there is reduced blood supply to that region and there will be loss of uh, atp by my i mean there there will be failure of mitochondria to produce atp so now what happens is there is a loss of atp production the membrane ion will fail in functioning well as a result of which there will be excess calcium accumulation inside the cells and there will be glutamate release from the synaptic terminal now we told there is glutamate release from synaptic terminal that also contributes to intracellular calcium accumulation so calcium keeps increasing now excess calcium is going to produce free radicals and these free radicals are responsible for the death of neuronal cells and the infected area okay so we said neuronal cell death occurs so infarction has occurred and uh, this infected area gets surrounded by an ischemic area okay and the function of that ischemic area is reversible if you restore blood flow within a reasonable time and that area is called as the ischemic penumbra okay so i hope you understood the pathophysiology 
i'll just say it once again very fast there is a blood vessel in the brain it gets blocked either by an emboli or thrombi and uh, there will be reduced blood flow as a result of which the mitochondria in the region produces less at or uh, fails to produce atp and loss of atp leads to the failure of the membrane ion pump to function normally so calcium gets accumulated inside the cell and glutamate release occurs from synaptic terminal this glutamate release contributes to more calcium accumulating in the cells this calcium produces free radicals and those free radicals cause neuronal cell death and um, the infected area usually gets surrounded by an ischemic area and the function of the ischemic area can be restored if the blood is restored within reasonable amount of time and that area is called ischemic penumbra now these are the causes of ischemic stroke now as you notice uh, the common causes are divided into three headings thrombosis emboli cardiomyopathic uh, i could read you some uh, thrombosis is lacunar stroke large vessel thrombosis and um, embolic occlusion uh, can be artery to artery carotid bifurcation aortic arch then ca- cardioembolic uh, can be because of diseases like atrial fibrillation myocardial infarction dilated cardiomyopathy so as i said uh, the common causes are divided into thrombosis uh, thrombosis emboli and cardiomyopathy now uncommon causes which is usually the causes responsible for stroke in young people okay that is hypercoagulable disorders like protein c deficiency protein s deficiency uh, then uh, anti thrombin 3 deficiency sle thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura these are some of the common causes now the clinical features so before we head on to the clinical features i would like to point out certain terms which will be commonly used in the clinical features which might get you confused uh, now know what a hemiparesis is hemiparesis means that there is weakness or uh, partial paralysis on one side of the body whereas hemiplegia means there is total paralysis on one side of the body now uh, you will come across a term called as homonymous hemianopia homonymous hemianopia now hemianopia means that there is loss of vision on one side of your eye on one side of the eye that means your eye gets divided by a vertical midline into a right and left side so either on the right or left side there is a loss of vision now homonymous hemianopia means there is loss of vision on the same side of both your eyes okay and now another term that will come often is uh, contralateral contralateral means on the opposite side of that of the lesion then gait apraxia gait apraxia means you are not able to walk normally okay that's what it basically means now the clinical features are produced based on the uh, occlusion of certain arteries so if there is occlusion of middle cerebral artery these are the features that is going to be produced one is contralateral hemiparesis okay and that is going to be worse in your arms and your face than in the legs you will also have contralateral hemianesthesia that means on the opposite side of the lesion uh, on one half of your body you will have loss of sensation then contralateral homonymous hemianopia gaze preference to the ipsilateral side ipsilateral means the same side then if the dominant sphere gets affected you present with a global aphasia and dysarthria okay and if non dominant sphere gets affected you present with constructional apraxia and hemispatial neglect now if the occlusion of anterior cerebral artery occurs you get paralysis of the contralateral foot and leg which means here they have contralateral hemi paresis which is worse in the leg and then there will be sensory loss over the contralateral foot and leg so there is paralysis as well as sensory loss in contralateral foot and leg then you have gait apraxia then you also have confusion and poor judgment so these are the features then if the posterior cerebral artery gets occluded there will be contralateral homonymous hemianopia unilateral cortical blindness memory impairment and hemibalismus that is only if peripheral occlusion occurs if a central occlusion occurs and that occurs in the thalamus contralateral sensory loss and spontaneous pain and if it occurs in the cerebral peduncle 
there will be third cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia and if it's in the brain stem cranial nerve palsy that is uh, you'll have cranial nerve palsy nystagmus and pupillary abnormalities so always remember peripheral occlusion these are the features and in central occlusion there uh, it, it can be based on where it affects thalamus cerebral peduncle and brain stem occlusion of the internal carotid artery produces an ipsilateral blindness with all features of middle cerebral artery stroke that we discussed earlier now occlusion of the vertebro basilar system okay that produces the following symptoms that is dizziness there will be truncal or limb ataxia that means the body or the limbs will be out of balance then you will be unilateral or bilateral cranial nerve deficits then you will have pupil and eye movement abnormalities impaired consciousness spastic paresis and cross sensory and motor deficits so the points that i've written down here are the most important ones to be mentioned so uh, we discussed about few vessels middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery which has a central and peripheral occlusion and vertebro basilar system so when the clinical features are asked this is how you describe it now the investigations investigations mainly that you do is a ct scan of the head now you would be wondering why because you know plain ct head is actually the imaging modality of choice because it's done fast and it's widely available okay so uh, the infected area usually appears as a hypo intense area and uh, this um, infect is not visible for 24 to 48 hours in a ct scan okay and uh, brain stem lesions will also not appear properly on a ct scan when you look at the mri of the brain it's actually more sensitive in picking up an infarction and it can also pick up early infarctions from your brain but the reason why an mri brain um, is like not uh, the imaging modality of choice is because it's expensive and it's also time consuming now one one benefit we have of ct scan head over mri brain is that ct scan head can exclude abscesses neoplasms hemorrhage it can exclude those three main things so uh, that's it okay so the uh, two main investigations is ct scan head and mri of the brain now another investigation you do is a ct angiogram or an mr angiogram and why you do this is to identify the exact location where your artery in the brain got blocked so you need to know that exact location of the arterial block that's why you do a ct angiogram or an mr angiogram now carotid and vertebral artery doppler is basically done because you have to know if there is any disease of the vertebral or carotid arteries if there is and is stenosis and so on ecg and echo that is important we told that one of the causes and one of the risk factors for stroke was cardiac diseases like af right so we need an ecg and echo to know if they have any heart problems now there are routine examinations that you need to do you have to look for the blood sugar to know if they have diabetes and uh, you have to look for the lipid profile to know if they have dyslipidemia and you have to certainly check for uh, their history of hypertension then look for uh, urea creatinine electrolytes hemoglobin cell count these are all uh, ex- uh, things that you could like uh, it's not necessary to mention it but uh, blood sugar urea creatinine and all are important and toxicology screen as well that is only if that you suspect there is a poisoning or something now this is the general management okay you have a general management and you have a specific management in general management you have to assess the airway breathing circulation then you have to secure the airway of the person and monitor their oxygenation and provide a respiratory ventilatory support if it's required now how do you specifically manage them so before we go on to the first point we come to the third one if you notice the heading is intravenous thrombolysis if the patient is reporting within 3 hours of the onset of stroke you have to give them recombinant tissue plasminogen activator or rtpa 
and it should be only given if the person reports within 3 hours of onset of stroke and if it is given after 3 hours there is a high risk of intracranial bleed okay now which all situation is the rtpa strictly contraindicated now if you have had a recent major surgery if you have a high blood pressure more than 185 bar 110 mm of mercury or if you have a prior stroke or a head injury in the last 3 months or gastrointestinal bleeding in the preceding 3 weeks these are all major contraindications for recombinant tissue plasminogen activity it can be only given if these risk factors are not there and at the same time the patient reports within 3 hours of onset of stroke okay now anti coagulation and anti thrombotic treatment anti thrombotic treatment is very important you have to give the patient aspirin 325 mg loading dose and 75 mg daily okay now aspirin should be withheld okay 24 hours before and after the thrombolytic therapy so th- that means if the patient reported within 3 hours you gave them rtpa then you should withhold aspirin you should only give it 24 hours after the thrombolytic therapy okay and also it should be withheld 24 hours before the thrombolytic therapy so aspirin loading dose is 325 mg and daily you can give 75 mg now you'd be wondering why aspirin right aspirin is given because it prevents the extension of the clot and reduces the chance of a recurrent stroke okay and anti coagulation anti coagulation is not that important in an ischemic stroke it's very uh, important in cardioembolic stroke okay if you have atrial fibrillation and develop a cardioembolic stroke so in that case is what anti coagulants will you give you can give heparin or low molecular weight heparin and that should be given subcutaneously and later you can switch to oral therapy with warfarin now other uh, techniques that you have to do is an endovascular technique endovascular technique will include intra arterial thrombolysis and endovascular thrombectomy now when do you use this techniques that is intra arterial thrombolysis and endovascular thrombectomy these treatments are used when there is an occlusion of large vessels like middle cerebral artery internal carotid artery and basilar artery large vessel occlusion is kind of the indication for this one then supportive measures you should make sure the patient does not develop pneumonia uti uh, deep vein uh, thrombosis you should give them dvt profile access and uh, if they have fever you should give them antipyretics do a surface cooling and the blood glucose should be always kept at less than 110 mg per deciliter and now there is a chance for edema which could peak on the second or third day of the stroke so that cerebral edema uh, should be dealt with by giving manitol 20 percentage okay manitol 20 percentage is given as 100 ml iv and it is given every 6 to 8 hourly and then you can also give a head and elevation so that's how you deal with cerebral edema or a raised icp and blood glucose should be kept at less than 110 mg and uh, fever being treated with antipyretics now and uh, give them dvt profile access now rehabilitation is the last measure where you go for physical uh, physiotherapy occupational therapy and speech therapy now specific management just go through the headings you have to give intravenous thrombolysis with rtpa provided they report within 3 hours of the onset of stroke you have to give them uh, aspirin 325 mg uh, loading dose and 75 mg daily which prevents the extension of clot and recurrent stroke you have to give them anticoagulation which is uh, indicated in cardioembolic stroke okay you can give it with heparin uh, subcutaneously and later switch to warfarin and then you can go for endovascular techniques like uh, endovascular thrombectomy provided there's a large vessel occlusion like middle cerebral artery then you have your supportive measures and you have your rehabilitation measures so uh thank you for your keen attention and i really 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 hope that you would like share and subscribe and please do subscribe for more videos thank you